Hello, my name is Gile. I'm an ETCP certified rigger. Um, today we're going to talk about uh, rigging hardware, uh, rigging inspection, and safe operation. Um, we're going to look at some uh, rigging hardware and talk about safe working loads and how we develop uh, the criteria for those loads. Uh, we're looking at hardware that's not safe and that's not rated. And in addition, we'll be looking at the locking rail, the arbors, and we'll go to the loading gallery and finally to the grid iron. And then in addition to that, we'll talk a little bit about safety. Generally, the hardware that we use in rigging has a safety factor associated with it. And uh, let me explain quickly what a safety factor means. Uh, this is a quarter inch galvanized, uh, we call aircraft cable, uh, that we use for lift lines. Uh, galvanized quarter inch aircraft cable is rated to have an ultimate braking strength of about 7,000 pounds. However, what we do is we apply a safety factor of eight to that. So 7,000 pounds divided by eight is about, or is, 875 pounds. So in theater, we say when we're using quarter inch aircraft cable for running rigging, the ultimate braking strength is 7,000 pounds. But we say it has a safe working load of 875 pounds. So with static hardware, for example, a shackle, we apply a safety factor of five. Static rigging hardware has a safety factor typically of five to one, sometimes six to one. Um, on that type of hardware, it's actually going to be stamped. So it says here, the working load limit is 3 quarters T, 3 quarters of a ton. So that's 1,500 pounds. That 1,500 pa 1, pounds is what we say we can use this for. Now, ultimately, it has a much greater braking string. Um, but that's, what we, that's our, our, our working load limit. Um, I'm going to give you some examples of hardware that is rated um, for overhead lifting and rigging and some hardware that you see frequently being used but is in fact not rated. Um, the easiest example is the dog clip or snap hook. Uh, this has absolutely no rating for um, overhead lifting. Also, uh, aluminum carabiners are not generally rated for overhead lifting. There's uh, some debate as to whether th they can be used in, uh, in theater within the industry. I know carabiners get used a lot more in arena rigging and rock and roll rigging. But as a rule of thumb, I would discourage you from using aluminum carabiners for theater rigging, um, and especially ones that are small and clearly not rated. Usually they're, say, somewhere not for climbing or stamped. But um, um, for making wire rope clips, there are basically two types. These types, these types are what we call malleable. Um, they're identified usually because they're you kind of have this V and they have the points on them. Uh, malleable cable clips are not rated for overhead lifting. What we, what we do want to see is what are called forged cable clips and uh, you can see, if you kind of look at them side by side, how much more, how much more robust they are in construction. Um, additionally, uh, 
this type of hardware, which is typically available in Home Depot or Lowe's or a hardware store, uh, is not for overhead lifting. It's, it's unlikely that you're going to find this type of hardware in, in a hardware store. This is something you'd have to get from a rigging supply store or a specialty store. Uh, and obviously, it there's a cost premium that comes with that. Um, as much as possible, I believe it's a good practice to buy hardware that has the manufacturer's name stamped on it. Um, an example of that um, would be this, this shackle here that we saw before that has the working load limit. It also has uh, CM, which is the initials of the manufacturer, um, and USA stamped on it. Uh, just in contrast, here's a quarter inch shackle does have a working load stamped on it. It's stamped Japan. Um, and here's, here's a pretty common one. It does have a working load limit of one ton stamped on it, uh, but it's also stamped China. And the reason we have a preference for American made, for American made uh, and manufactured stamped hardware is because in the event of a failure of hardware then we know who manufactured it and there's a certain level of accountability. Um, if my shackle from China fails, uh, it's unlikely that China is going to uh, stand up behind their product as a nation. That's not a knock on any other nation. It's just the point that you have to have a company, not a country, uh, to go back to. Um, this is an example of a rated uh, turnbuckle. It's steel forged. And this is an example of an aluminum non-rated turnbuckle. This should not be used for overhead lifting. Um, you can also see in addition to the aluminum body, that the eyes are not fully closed. They're just bent across. This is an example of a forged eye that is rated and can be used for overhead lifting. As you can see, it's completely, it's completely closed. Uh, this is an example of a piece of hardware stamped Taiwan that does have the working load rated stamped into it. Uh, this is rated for 1,750 pounds. Um, there used to be a lot of myth in theater rigging as to whether or not um, these quick link type hardware were acceptable for overhead lifting. Uh, if they are stamped, if they are rated, then they can be used. Uh, the reason that there's a great preference for shackles um, rather than quick links is because um, with quick links, unless they are completely closed tight, and they don't have to be closed wrench tight, just hand tight, if they're anything, if they're open, then that rating goes out the door. They're, they're fail uh, under a relatively light load. Hardware that is rated but not necessarily intended for overhead lifting um, or is not rated with a working load, uh, it comes, we borrow from the automotive industry, from the Society of uh, Automotive Engineers. And uh, I just wanted to give you an example. This would be a uh, bolt that is not rated. It's completely flat plane on the back of the head. These are both examples of SAE grade five rated hardware. So when you use hardware in rigging, just bolts and nuts, you want it to be rated. It needs to have that strength. Okay, and then finally I just wanted to talk about termination methods. We talked about 
using cable, excuse me, using um, cable clips. Uh, importantly, when we when we when we talk about these safe loads, it sometimes when we have this termination hardware, uh, whether it's uh, copper sleeve press or if it's cable cable clips that will reduce the strength of this wire rope. So we already said we were giving this reduction of um, a factor of eight. Uh, now we're going to multiply a reduction factor of 20 percent for cable clip termination. So that strength of the cable, what we just said was 875, now gets reduced down to 700 pounds. So we say that the cable, cable has a strength of 875 pounds. If we use cable clips to form an eye and make a termination on it, then we're reducing that strength down by 20%. So we take our original ultimate breaking strength of 7,000 pounds, and we multiply it times 0.8 and we come up with 5,600 pounds. And we divide that by a safety factor of eight, and we're now at 700 pounds, of a working safe, safe working load for this cable. Manufacturers sometimes claim that uh, cable clips that reduce the strength by 20%, that a copper swage or sleeve will not reduce uh, the strength of the cable. I think in general it's probably worth applying some factor of strength reduction for the NICO sleeve. Maybe just 5%. Um, that's an example of an unswaged copper, copper sleeve for 3 16 inch cable. Um, and this is an example of a uh, swaged eighth inch aircraft cable. As part of the inspection, what you will want to do is you will want to check on, on terminations of aircraft cable with cable clips what the torque is. You should have a precision torque wrench if you're going to do this. And that torque should be what the manufacturer recommends. Typically, for quarter inch aircraft cable clips, we find the manufacturers recommend 15 foot pounds of torque. To check the correct termination of a copper swage, we have a variety of what we call go, no-go gauges. And the gauges, the gauge type is designed to match the tool type that made the swage. So that's a very important concept because there are different manufacturers of the sleeves and even within those manufacturers individually, there are different tools that are used. Uh, tools like this one for loco sleeves are going to be different than tools for NICO sleeves. Uh, this is an example of a NICO sleeve. And this is an example of the gauge that's used to check for compliant swaging. And you have to refer back to the cable size in the manual to know which slot should be, should be fit. In this case, it's a oval M, and it shows a compliant swage. If you come across a swage that's not compliant, then it should be re-terminated. Manufacturers generally do not recommend that you make an adjustment to the tool and re-swage it. Um, also, only copper sleeves, only copper sleeves 
are rated for overhead lifting. Aluminum sleeves are not acceptable. Uh, you'll probably see them a lot, but it's, it's incorrect. You can use aluminum s sleeves for wire rope terminations that are not for overhead lifting, but if it's going to support a load overhead, it needs to be copper. Um, interestingly, there are sleeve products that are coated with zinc or other materials that appear to be, this is a good example, appear to be aluminum, but in fact, if you were to scrape through on this, you would eventually get down, you can see a little bear, um, to copper underneath the coating. So just because it's silver, don't assume it's aluminum, you might just want to scratch it with a knife to know. When you make your own swages, you should definitely have a go-no-go -no -go gauge that matches the tool that you're using, and you should check your swages for, compliant, for compliancy um, frequently. Uh, when the tool gets off, then uh, it requires readjustment, and all tools are adjustable. Okay, so let's look at some of the stage hardware uh, that we've been talking about as it's applied to the rigging situation. We've got, of course, our batten. Um, actually, we'll go from the top here. So we've got our uh, quarter inch wire rope uh, lift line uh, terminated here with the thimble eye and two cable clips. So we remember we've gone down now to where we're saying the strength here is 700 pounds when new. Uh, and then it connected to that is this chain. The chain it type is really not known. Um, it's typically uh, what we see installed now is a little bit more robust, uh, but you would have to look and see, do the research to find out what that rating is. Uh, one important idea about chain rating is Chain manufacturers generally give a safety rating of perhaps four to their chain, and they say that their safe working load is based upon a safety factor of four. Again, in rigging for stage, we're using a safety factor of six or five. So we have to go back and do the math and find out what the real safety factor is, what the real working load is for a theater rigging application. And what's actually doing the work here is this bolt. And this is a grade five rated bolt. Uh, and then one and a half wraps around the pipe. The type of inspection, you know, on, on a venue that you're working in, for example, uh, once you know that copper sleeve has passed its go test with go gauge, you never have to check it again. It's not going to go out. Um, occasionally with uh, cable clips, uh, it does over time stretch and requires some tightening. Uh, Generally, this is very, very rare, uh, but it does happen. Um, so you set your torque wrench at the compliant torque. In this case, we're at 15 pounds. And we're good. The other things you want to check for is if you have a shackle that's making your termination. Is to check and see if this shackle is moused. And by moused, we're talking about a very small thin gauge wire that you're going to wrap through the hole in the shackle pin and wrap around and tie itself off so that the pin cannot in any way become loose. All shackles 
should be moused. Also, turnbuckles should be moused. Sometimes there is a hole through for a cotter pin. Um, Otherwise, the same thin gauge wire can be used to wrap to secure it so it won't become unwound. Um, you want to check, make sure you have your rated hardware with your locking nut on it. And that's what we look for on terminations at the bat. So uh, now we're going to talk about what to look for at the locking rail. Uh, this is a typical locking rail. Um, just to go through and identify uh, the components for you, we've got the floating floor tension block, uh, the operation line, um, the rope lock, uh, the locking rail itself, um, the arbor, and within the arbor we have locking collars and spreader plates. Arbor rods, the arbor backbone, and then the termination point for the operating line. Uh, we'll look at the top of the arbor later. Later, okay. So, the idea of having a floating tension block at the floor originally came as a necessity when we were using um, manila, hemp, some kind of natural fiber rope, uh, which was subject to shrinkage or elongation based on environmental conditions. Now with uh, synthetic ropes, that's really not a factor. Um, but we still keep uh, floating blocks. One reason is that for some stage hands, it's preferable to get a little bit of slack on the line before operating it, and that's achieved by pulling on the back and kicking down on the shift to lift it. And then you might be able to get a little a wrap on it before you unlock the lock, just to make sure that you're, you're a bounced load. So the rope lock I uh, there's four bolts that secure the rope lock to the locking rail. Uh, it's prudent to periodically check to make sure that those nuts are tight and that all bolts and nuts are present. Um, rope locks are generally designed to hold an out of bounds condition of 50 pounds and not more. Uh, I think most experienced riggers have found that rope locks will exceed that, but it's not what the manufacturer recommends, and it certainly shouldn't be used. Uh, I can tell you most rigging accidents uh, result in some way uh, from a failure at the rope lock to hold the load, among other things, but that's one part. Um, with, the, with the counterweight arbor, um, we want to make sure that the operation line termination is good and secure. This is a fine example where it's a double hitch knot and then tied back to itself with wire ties. Um, the one concern that you might have is if the tension block is all the way up and the tail is excessive, that you would have a condition where this tail is going to run into the bottom of the shift. So this is a good example of an operation line termination going through the eye at the bottom of the arbor. It's double hitch, and it's tied back to itself with two wire ties. Uh, sometimes it can be done with electrical tape. What you do want to be aware of is you want to have enough tail that you can make some adjustment later on, but you want to keep it short enough that when the arbor is in its low position, that that tail is not so long that it's going to run into the shiv of the block. So uh, as we look at the arbor itself, um, you want to look at the guides in the back, make sure that they're not worn through, 
there should be a little bit of looseness to them. They shouldn't be real tight. Um, it's only a guide bar for the arbor. It's not supporting any loads. Um, at the arbor, we have these locking collars. Uh, locking collars should always be in the tight lock position unless the arbor is being loaded or unloaded with counterweights. I can't stress that enough, and I'll explain to you why. The purpose of the spreader plates on an arbor is in the event of an accident, of a runaway, uh, it's, it's going to save the weights from falling off the arbor. So at the top of the arbor we have the locking collars and then we have spreader plates. Spreader plates should be located <clears throat> every 24 to 30 inches of counterweight stack. Um, in fact, it would be prudent to mark the backbone of the arbor with some contrasting color enamel paint that would indicate where those spreader plates are located. Importantly, there always has to be one spreader plate on the top of the counterweight stack, at least one. It's a very common misconception that one spreader plate is intended to be left on top of the batten weight on the arbor, the dead load, which in, in this theater is nicely marked with white painted weights. The spreader plate should be lifted up when weights are loaded until it gets to 24 to 30 inches. And then a spreader plate is left there, more loading occurs, and the spreader plate is left on the top with the locking collars. The reason for spreader plates is because in the event of a runaway where the arbor is flying out of control, either in the upward direction or in the lower direction, and it crashes, it has a collision, it's stopped here by this piece of wood. Now, if it's got enough weight, it's going fast enough, it's going to go right through there. And when that happens, the arbor itself will deform. And these rods will spread open, and the weights will fall out. If the spreader plates are distributed correctly, it will prevent that from happening. And as you can imagine, the worst case scenario is that there's an out of bounds condition where the batten is heavy and there's not enough, not enough weight on the arbor and it goes, it runs away to the upward, causes a crash. If those spreader plates aren't there and the locking collars aren't locked, then it can cascade counterweights down to the floor, which is obviously a lethal condition. So we said that the rope locks are generally rated by the manufacturer to hold an inbound load of no more than 50 pounds. The rope locks at the back have a spade head screw for adjustment and they should have, in addition to that, a locking nut here. Uh, either as the rope wears and gets a little flatter or thinner, or even over long periods of time where the locking dogs become worn, some adjustment is required. And it should be such that you can't move, move the rope in the lock position. but also not too tight where excessive force is required to try to close it. That's, that's a good adjustment. It's not difficult to open and close and it's holding that rope. Once it's adjusted, 
screw that lock nut in and tighten it off with the tool. Very not very not too much torque, just enough to get tight. Okay. The most important consideration uh, at the loading gallery is not to stack uh, the weights above the tow rail so that there's no possibility it can be kicked off um, below. Um, the alignment of weights here up against the wall and again here up against uh, the tow rail is uh, an excellent configuration uh, and should be maintained that way. So uh, now we're at the upper loading gallery at the gridiron level and we're looking at the top of the arbor and uh, just like the batten, the lift lines are terminated here. Um, these uh, cable, cable clip uh, nuts should be checked for torque occasionally. Um, and uh, we have a good operation line termination. You get a double hitch tied back and uh, wire tied or taped to itself. Again, you want to have the same situation in terms of tail length that you get as much tail as you can to, for make adjustments, but short enough that it's not going to run into the shiv of the head block above. Both of the arbor rods at the top of the arbor and the bottom of the arbor, there are nuts. It's prudent to check that these nuts are tight occasionally. Um, and that's what we look for at the top of the arbor. Uh, at the gridiron elevation, um, with the installed system, there's generally uh, not much uh, that goes wrong unless there's a modification to the system or there's an accident where damage occurs uh, or there was a problem with the uh, initial installation. Um, one condition uh, that can happen is because the lift lines here are not managed by a sag bar or idler pulleys, they're just kind of hanging loose, it's possible that they can, in slack, come down and run underneath the shiv of a, an adjacent lift line. And when that happens, then you've got the situation where it's actually running in one direction and the shiv is rotating in the other direction. So there's quite a bit of friction that's generated. A good rule of thumb is if you're operating a line set and you feel friction, either constant friction in operation or moments of friction in the travel of the batten in the arbor, then that should raise a flag. There's something wrong and it should be investigated. Uh, I've certainly seen situations where um, a lot of damage has occurred and uh, the users told me, yeah, we've heard this terrible noise for many, many months uh, before whatever happened eventually failed. Um, so in, in addition to, uh, to having a feel for when there is or is not friction in the operating line, develop an ear and when something is excessively noisy or squeaky, then investigate it. Uh, a lift line interfering with another lift line at the loft block is a good example of how friction can be created. Um, in some venues, there are sprinkler pipes, there are conduits that are mounted very, very close and sometimes interfere with lift lines. That would be a good, good example of where noise is being generated uh, and the lift line is slowly cutting into a conduit or a sprinkler pipe. Um, over time, wire rope will, seems to cut through just about anything, uh, including hard steel. So. Look for interferences for your lift lines. They should always be free and clear, running up vertically from the batten, 
across the loft block, and across to the head block. As the lift lines are running off the head blocks, there should be no fleet angle that exceeds one and a half degrees. If the lift line, if the loft block has been relocated for some reason and slid over, so that li this lift line in its horizontal travel is coming off the side of the shiv, it will cause damage uh, and prematurely wear the cable and certainly create friction. Uh, in theater, we use the fleet angle tolerance of one and a half degrees. We've been talking about uh, stage hardware, rigging hardware, and the rigging equipment. Uh, the vast majority of accidents uh, that happen in theaters are not the result of hardware failures or malfunction of equipment. It's uh, human error. And um, the most common cause truly is inexperienced users. Uh, all users of a counterweight system should be trained in safe operation and uh, a record should be kept of who is and who is not authorized to operate the system. The most common cause of an accident with a counterweight, manual counterweight rigging system is a runaway scenario. And the most uh, common sequence of events that leads up to that when the baton is in the low position and it has loads on it, whether it's scenery or lighting or draperies, and the arbor is up at the high elevation, what sometimes happens is stagehands or students begin to remove the load from the baton. So they start striking the lights off, taking off the cable, uh, or taking off the scenery before the counterweights are removed at this elevation. So if you have 800 pounds of load on your baton and it's gone and you have 800 pounds of load at your arbor that's still there and the rope lock is only designed to hold 50 pounds, there's a good chance it's going to run away and come down and crash. And that's where we go back to the importance of placing spreader plates and tightening down those locking collars on top. Um, there are I've seen a lot of injuries where uh, their rope lock is held and an uh, unknowing operator goes to release that lock and all of a sudden the rope is moving out of control. Uh, it's very difficult to resist the urge to try to grab it and stop it uh, so people d will have injure their hands. Um, if you think about it, if th the load is 300 pounds, uh, unless you're more than 300 pounds and you could hold on to it, the odds are it's going to take you, with, it's going to fly you up as far as you can go. So uh, when you open the lock at the locking rail, before you open it, check the rope, see if there's tension, look at what's on the arbor and look at what's on the baton and communicate with your coworkers um, what you're doing. Uh, so that everyone's safe.